To best understand the renewed interest in the TurboGrafx-16, let's go back to the future together to the year 1989. The system had been out for two years at that point as the PC Engine in Japan and had just launched in the United States as the TurboGrafx. And to celebrate this new milestone in the system's history, it shipped with the pack-in game... Keith Courage and Alpha Zones. Considered that the Sega Genesis was shipping with the worldwide hit Sonic the Hedgehog, and just two years later the Super Nintendo shipping with the worldwide smash hit Super Mario World, and the poor TurboGrafx, it didn't stand a chance. And when reviewers of the day took note that the TurboGrafx-16 had a 16-bit graphics processing set, but only an 8-bit CPU, gamers hungry for the most bits you could shove into one single console panned the TurboGrafx-16. The Sega Genesis and Mega Drive went on to sell 30.75 million total units worldwide. Nintendo sold a staggering 49.1 million Super Nintendo and Super Famicom systems. As for NEC and the TurboGrafx-16, well it sold a paltry 5.62 million total units worldwide. So if the TurboGrafx-16 got crushed under the weight of the mighty Sega Genesis and Super Nintendo, what's causing a renewed interest in the system in the modern retro gaming scene? The fact is, we're better educated, better informed gamers than we've ever been in the history of gaming. We know now that the number of bits and bytes that a game system can crunch are less important than the quality of the gameplay itself. Do you know the exact horsepower, torque, and fuel economy specifications for your vehicle? Or do you just love the feeling you get when you fire it up and press the pedal to the metal? No one has demonstrated this better than Nintendo with the Wii and the Switch. Neither of these systems boast the highest amount of power when compared to its contemporaries, but both of them have an incredible library of games that can be enjoyed by gamers of all ages. Now that you can look through that set of lenses to look at the TurboGrafx-16, you'll find that there's a lot more to this system than just the sum of its parts. The TurboGrafx-16 may be rocking an 8-bit central processing unit, but it actually has a dual 16-bit graphics processing unit. The system has a total of 8 kilobytes of onboard RAM. There's a total color palette of 512 colors, but what's impressive is that it can show 482 of those colors all at once on screen. It's one of the first consoles to offer stereo sound through the use of the Turbo Booster add-on pack. And NEC launched a new era of add-on peripherals for game systems by making the TurboGrafx-16 and PC Engine the first system to offer a CD-ROM add-on. Both the TurboGrafx-16 and its PC Engine counterpart both have their games stored in this unique media format called Hue Cards, also known as a Turbo Chip. The game and instructions came packaged in a jewel case which made them slimmer and easier to store than traditional cartridge media of the era. The TurboPad controller that ships with the TurboGrafx-16 is unique to the era in that it includes TurboFire buttons that have three different speed settings. There's only one controller port at the front of the unit and it's proprietary, but with add-ons like the TurboTap, you can connect up to five total controllers to the system for the 19 games that actually support it. Speaking of games, a system's only as good as its games, and there were 686 total games released for the TurboGrafx-16 and PC Engine worldwide. Let's take a look at some bangers that were released in Hue Card format in North America for the TurboGrafx-16. Sometimes a system just nails it with a launch title right out of the gate, and that's the case with Blazing Lasers. Launched in 1989, the game is a vertical scrolling shoot 'em up with a plot based on the Japanese movie Gunhead. Your base is under attack by an enemy force known as the Dark Squadron, and it's up to you to destroy this evil alien armada and its special weapon. Fortunately, you have an array of weapons available to use, some better than others. There are nine total levels in the game, and the boss battles are epic, and every level of the game has one or more of them to battle. Critics of the era praise this game for its visuals, which never seem to slow down no matter how much the game throws at you on screen at any one time. One of the unique gameplay elements of this game for the era is that you can actually control the speed of your ship. You can select from one of three speeds to either choose a high degree of speed or a high degree of precision maneuverability. Today, many retro gamers consider Blazing Lasers to be the premier shoot-em-up on the TurboGrafx-16, and in some cases, the premier Hue card game on the entire system. When Bomberman 93 dropped for the TurboGrafx-16, Electronic Gaming Monthly named it the best game of the year for the system, and for good reason. Black Bomberman has stolen seven ships from the Pan-Galactic Bureau's mother computer and scrambled them across several planets in the Magellan system. It's up to you as Ace Detective Bomber Cop to save the day. To complete each of the mazes, you control Bomber Cop and deploy bombs in strategic locations. You'll have to use bombs to destroy walls to access key parts of the maze and to destroy enemies. Once you destroy all of the enemies in a maze, the portal to the next maze will be revealed. There are seven themed worlds with eight stages to explore and the eighth stage of each world has a boss battle. This game deserves all of the praise that it got from the press of the day and gamers today, but I want to mention one important thing. A lot of stuff flashes in this game, and if you have photosensitivity challenges, it's not a good fit for your game collection. 
I've edited out most of the flashes in this video, but be aware the flashes are in fact there during gameplay. When Bonk's Adventure launched for the TurboGrafx-16, Entertainment Weekly rated it the number three game of the year out of all video games released that year. There's a reason it garnered so much praise. It's just a heck of a lot of fun to play. The TurboGrafx-16 shipped with Keith Courage and Alpha Zones, but Bonk quickly became its well-known mascot. This side-scrolling platformer features the cartoonish and kid-like Bonk. Your mission is to travel the prehistoric world, battle enemies, and rescue Princess Za from the evil King Drool. Your primary weapon, your crow and forehead, which you use to bonk enemies. Along the way, you can collect power-ups like ground pounds and temporary invincibility. There are five total levels in the game, each with a number of sub-levels to complete. The game spawns several sequels on the platform, so if you can't get enough of smashing your head into things, you're in luck. Among the genres the system is well known for is video pinball, and Devil's Crush is the bell of the ball. Released in 1990, the game has an eerie occult theme with skulls, skeletons, and demons on the playfield. The pinball playfield is three screens tall and has flippers at each of the various sections. Among the many things to love about this game is its rockin' soundtrack, which never seems to get old during gameplay. Throughout your journey, you'll also discover that there are bonus battles available, accessed by achieving key objectives and launching the ball into the right place on the playfield. It's worth noting that when the game was ported over from Japan to the North American market, a lot of the content in it was censored, but none of that really takes away from the key elements of the pinball gameplay. It's a fantastic game on the system and a must-have for any lovers of video pinball. Back in the day, it wasn't so easy to get high-quality ports of your favorite arcade titles on home consoles. When Galaga 88 was ported to the PC Engine in Japan and later Galaga 90 for the TurboGrafx-16, it was a gem. The game is the third sequel to the original Galaxian game, following Galaga and Gapless. Among the many improvements and upgrades to the game is the ability to get not just two captured ships together, but three. If you can pull this off, you become nearly unstoppable. That is, unless anything collides with your ships. An innovative element to this game is that the path through the game is not linear. If you collect two warp capsules by shooting specific targets, you'll be able to use them to warp from one dimension to another to take a different path through the game. The game actually has four different endings depending on which dimension you end in. And I think there are a few things as exciting in gaming as getting all 40 of the enemies into bonus stages and getting the fireworks celebration. If you're into turn-based strategy games, Military Madness absolutely needs to be at the top of your list. It's the first entry into the series that's now known as the Nectaris series of games. Set in the year 2089, you take control of the Allied Union forces. Your mission? Defeat the evil Axis Xenon Empire. They're staged on the moon with their supreme atomic weapon, and they can't wait to use it to obliterate Earth. You take turns moving your units into strategic positions to battle the Axis Xenon forces. To win, you'll need to destroy enemy forces and occupy their prisoner of war camps. You know, as a liberating force, not as an actual prisoner of war. There are 16 total maps on which to wage war and a password system to save your progress. This is a thinking player's game, and it's a welcome change of pace on the system. You'd be forgiven if you thought to yourself, self, Newtopia for the TurboGrafx-16 looks an awful lot like that NES game that came in the gold cartridge. And you'd be absolutely right, Newtopia is very much a clone of that game. But there are two things to take into consideration here. First of all, that's not a bad thing, as that game's pretty darn good. Second of all, there's enough new stuff going on here to distinguish this game from that one. In this overhead action-adventure game released in 1990, you play as the hero Jazida out to rescue Princess Aurora from the evil Dearth. Dearth stole the eight ancient medallions needed to maintain peace and prosperity, and you guessed it, it's your job to get them back. Your progress is saved through a series of passwords, but I hope you like really long passwords because these are 24 characters long each. At least they're out there on the internet for you when you need them. Both lighthearted in nature and deceptively difficult, Pac-Land is a near-perfect port of its arcade source material. The original arcade game was released in North America by Valley Midway in 1984, and it's the first side-scrolling platform game in the series. Your goal in each stage is to locate a lost fairy and return them to their home in Fairyland. Along the way, the five members of the Ghost Gang, Blinky, Inky, Pinky, Clyde, and Sue, will be out to stop you. The game uses a movement mechanic inspired by the arcade classic Track and Field. You tap one of two buttons to decide Pac-Man's direction and speed, and a third button to jump. Eat one of the yellow flashing power pellets and the ghost turn blue and run away from you. Then you can chomp them instead of them chomping on you. Once you deliver a fairy safely home, the fairy princess will grant you a special pair of magic shoes. You can use these magic shoes to fly through the air on your return voyage home. The game is based on the Pac-Man cartoon series from the 1980s, and it brings the fun of the original arcade game home to the TurboGrafx-16 system. I think it's possible the most famous game ever ported to the TurboGrafx-16 is Splatterhouse. Released in 1990, the game has become quite a cult classic. 
It placed such an emphasis on its violent nature, a parental warning written on the front of the game's casing said, The horrifying theme of this game may be inappropriate for young children and cowards. As the player, you control Rick trapped inside West Mansion. Your goal in the game is to traverse the mansion in an attempt to save your girlfriend Jennifer from a grisly fate. The game's look and feel are influenced by movies like Friday the 13th, Evil Dead 2, and Poltergeist, and the works of H.K. Lovecraft. Oh, you can punch, kick, and jump your way through the game, but there's nothing quite so satisfying as picking up a weapon off the ground and using it to knock the crap out of one of your enemies. There are great boss battles to be fought throughout the game and many mysteries to be revealed. In many collector circles, Splatterhouse is considered the best game you can get on a Hue card. The game considered by a number of TurboGrafx gamers to be the best-looking Hue card game on the system is Super Star Soldier. From the instant the game hits the ground running, it just oozes a science fiction theme of speed, color, and audio-video fidelity. Simply stated, it's gorgeous. Just like with Blazing Lasers, it can just keep on throwing stuff out on the screen and it never seems to slow down. There are a number of boss battles throughout the game and they just do things with the turbo graphics that you just wouldn't think are possible. To go along with the great looks and sound is a highly competent vertical scrolling shoot 'em up game. The game takes place four years after the original Star Soldier game, where the forces of the dreaded Evil Brain have returned to do battle. This time they've brought along the ultimate spaceship with them, Mother Brain. Hey, that name sounds familiar, like it might have been borrowed from another Nintendo property. Write it down in the comments if you know which game it is. Part audiovisual masterpiece and part great shooter, you should absolutely put this game on your collector list if you have a TurboGrafx-16. If you'd like to learn about another great game system that's finally getting the love it deserves in the modern era, check out this GameCube video shown on screen and linked in the description.